Hello everyone, it's Benny, and in this video, we're going to be implementing our last collider for the time being, and that is the plane. Now, as I talked about in the last video, you don't want to add too many colliders to your physics engine. Why? Because every collider is going to need an intersect function with every other collider. And that very quickly ends up being an enormous number of intersect functions that you need to write. So you want to have as few as possible. And that's why we're implementing a plane today. Because here's the thing about a plane. By itself, it's just, well, it's a plane. It's an infinite, it's an infinite plane dividing 3D space into two halves. And that might not seem like a particularly interesting collider at first. Like, well, okay, I can use it to represent the ground or something, but what else would I use a plane for? Here's the interesting thing about a plane. Right now, we've just got one that's sort of along the ground, but what if I add a few more? Like, say, these. Okay, now I've got one for the ceiling and some, like, on the sides. So what? Well, it might not be obvious at first, but let's just clip away all those sides of the planes, and let's see what we're left with. What you see here is a frustum. And a frustum can be a very interesting collider. It can be useful for, of course, frustum culling and things like that, and it can also be useful for some other things. So all we did here is we took a couple of planes, well, more than a couple, but we took a few planes, and by combining them together, we've created a whole new collider. And we didn't even add, well, what you'd usually need for a new collider, which is new class, new intersect functions with everything else, because this is still just a collection of planes. And that is the power of having a plane collider. You can take planes, and you can combine a few together to build more complex colliders. And that's why we're going to be implementing a plane today. So, hopefully, that makes some sense as to why we're implementing planes specifically. But how do we represent a plane? How do we represent an infinite plane that divides 3D space into two halves? Well, let's go back to our basic floor plane. Now, as you probably know, if you've done any work with 3D computer graphics, and especially lighting, any plane has a normal, which is just a line perpendicular to it, that points up relative to the plane. And so does this one. So we can use a plane to sort of, or, excuse me, we can use a normal to define the orientation of a plane. And that's great. But we're going to need a little bit more information than that. Because, sure, this plane has this normal, but so does this plane, and this plane, and this plane, and this plane. So, we actually need two pieces of information to define a plane. We need the normal, that'll define the orientation that the plane is in, and we need some distance, which is how far along the normal the plane resides. So, a distance of zero would give us this plane right here. A distance of one would give us this plane, because it's right along the normal. A difference of something... I did it. A distance of something like 2.2 .2 might give us this plane here. Difference of something like negative 1.2 might give us something like this. Distance of negative 3 or something might get us this, etc., etc. So that's how planes are going to work in our physics engine. So without further ado, let's go ahead and let's implement planes. Now, as before, I went ahead and created a plane.h and plane.cpp off screen just to save us a little bit of video time. So, as I just mentioned, we're going to need a normal and a distance. So for the normal, I'm going to use a vector 3f, like I've used for just about everything else so far. I'm going to, of course, call m normal, and I'm going to have some const float that I'm going to call m distance. And to def we're of course, going to need the constructor and such, but I'm going to do that off screen. So one moment. Okay, so I went ahead and I added the getters and the constructor, just like I said. Now, something that's 
interesting and unique to a plane collider is you can normalize it. So I can have some function. Actually, it's going to be a plane. I'm going to call it, well, normal normalized, because it's going to return this plane except normalized. And it's going to be caught because it doesn't change anything. And there. And you might be wondering, well, how can I normalize a plane? And here's the thing. Because we're using the normal and distance representation of a plane, there's more than one way you can represent a plane, this is just one of them, the normal can have a length of its own. So this normal isn't necessarily unit length. It isn't necessarily one unit long. This can be 10 units long. And therefore, this distance, if it was, say, 5, it wouldn't represent 5 units. It would represent 5 times the length of the normal, which would be, in this case, 50, if that makes any sense. So because our normal isn't necessarily unit length, we can have the option to normalize it, make everything relative to unit length again, because as you probably noticed, things can get a little bit confusing when things aren't necessarily unit length. So, let's save that, and let's go to plane.cpp and implement this normalized function. Fortunately, the normalized function is pretty easy. I'm going to take a vector 3f, I'm going to call, excuse me, not vector 3f, a float that I'm going to call magnitude, you can call it length or whatever, but this is going to be mnormal.length. This is how long the normal is. And all we have to do here is we turn a plane, which takes the normal, divide it by the magnitude, so that effectively normalizes the normal, but we're also going to have, or take the distance, and divide that by the magnitude. So that that, well, is normalized as well. And don't forget to make this plane colon colon normalized, because it's a member of plane. And there. And now we can normalize our planes. So, with that, let's add an intersect function. So I'm going to have intersect data. That's what's going to return. And I'm going to call this intersect sphere. Now this is the only intersect function I'm going to add to plane for now. Later on, you can add intersect functions for AABBs and other things, but all I care about right now are spheres. So it's going to take a const sphere reference, or reference, over. And it's going to be const, because it doesn't change anything. And of course, to do that, I'm going to need to include bounding sphere.h. And remember, it's bounding sphere, not sphere. So yeah, make sure that you call that bounding sphere, not just sphere. And bounding sphere.h should include intersect data. Ah, I misspelled it. So make sure you, whoops, spell intersect data correctly. And there, so now I'm going to go to our implementation file. And now I'm going to, whoops, make sure you have plane colon colon intersect sphere because it's a member of the plane class. And now let's go in and let's implement the sphere intersection function. But how do we determine if this plane is intersecting a sphere or not? So, now let's talk about how we can determine if a sphere and a plane are intersecting or not. And the trick to this is in how the plane is defined. We've defined a plane in terms of a normal, which represents the orientation of the plane, and a distance, which represents how far along the normal that the plane is. So, what if we knew how far along the sphere is along the normal? Well, if we knew that, then determining if the sphere is intersecting the plane is just a simple matter of comparing it with, well, how far along the plane is along the normal. So, the problem simplifies to how can we determine how far along the normal the sphere is? And well, this, as it turns out, is just a vector dot product. Because what does a dot product give you? It gives you how far along a particular point is in a particular direction. So it's that simple. Take the sphere's center, do the dot product with the plane's normal, 
And what do you know? You now have how far along the sphere's center is along the plane's normal. And it's that simple. And that's the trick to determining if a sphere is intersecting a plane or not. So let's go ahead and let's implement this in code. So, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a float distance from sphere center. And this is going to be calculated with the exact process I just talked about. We're going to take the plane's normal and we're going to dot it with the hover dot get center. So the sphere is the center. And that'll give us how far along the sphere center is along the plane's normal. However, this doesn't give us the distance of the sphere's center from the plane. To do that, we're going to have to add m distance. And the reason this works is because m distance is how far the plane itself is along its normal. So if we add that, then, well, that Essentially, that's adjusting this distance based on how far the plane is along its normal. So this will now give us the actual distance of the sphere's center from the plane itself, because now we've taken into account both the plane's normal and how far along the plane is along its normal. But there's actually one more subtle thing that we want to do here. We actually want the absolute value here, because this will, right now, this is going to give us, well, it's going to give us the sine distance. This will be positive if it's in front of the plane, and negative if it's behind the plane. And that's great, but we really don't want the sine. So we're just going to do fabs, which is math.h's standard floating point absolute value function, to give, a, to give us the absolute value of this. And there. But... Now that we have the absolute distance of the sphere's center from the plane, that's nice, but we actually want the distance of the sphere itself from the plane. So I'm going to say float distance from sphere. And how on earth are we going to calculate the actual distance of the sphere? And it's actually pretty simple. Let's say we have a scene that looks something like this. We have our sphere right here and our plane right here. Now we know this right here. If my cursor is the sphere's center, we know where this is. We know how far this is from the plane. So how do we figure out how far the sphere itself is from the plane? How do we essentially find out if this line my mouse is drawing? How do we find out how long this is? Well, we know how long this line is, the line from the plane to the sphere's center. All we have to do is subtract the sphere's radius, and that'll give us this line, which is the distance from the plane to the sphere. So it's really that simple. We'll just take the distance from sphere center and subtract over dot get radius. And there you go. We now know how far it is from the sphere. So from here, we can just return. We can I'll return an intersect data with... Now, how do we know if it's intersecting or not? Well, we know for a fact the absolute distance from, of the sphere from the plane. So if the distance of the sphere from the plane is less than zero, then we must be intersecting. Because if there is any distance at all between the plane and the sphere, then, well, clearly they're not intersecting. So it's that simple. And for the distance, of course, that's going to be distance from sphere. And there you go. That's all there is to the plane intersect sphere function. And with that, we're done. That's, that is how you determine if a plane and sphere are intersecting. It's really, that's really all there is to it. So, as with everything else, all we have to do now is do some basic testing to make sure our plane collider is actually working, and we're done. So, I went ahead and wrote the test code off screen. It looks something like this. I just created a basic plane here, and I tested it against all the spheres we already had created. So if I build and run, then, well, the, this is what it returns. So intersecting with sphere 1. Sphere 1's right here. It's along the plane. 
In fact, it's at the exact same location as the plane, so they're intersecting, and there's one unit of penetration. As you see, same, same report here. They're intersecting and one unit of penetration. And you notice the same thing is true for sphere 4 and sphere 3. The only difference between these are these are offset from the normal. So offsetting the spheres from the normal does not fool it. It still figures out the correct distance and whether or not they're intersecting, as reflected here. So final test is sphere 2, which, as you see, is above it. And this correctly determines they're not intersecting, and the sphere is two units above it. So our plane intersect sphere function is working beautifully. So, that just about wraps everything up for this video. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned. And in the next video, we'll finally start putting our colliders to a little bit more interesting use than just performing basic tests. So, thank you. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned. And I'll see you in the next video.